It's my pleasure to welcome the members and guests uh, and visitors to the speakers forum, Human Space Flight 50 Years, Apollo 50 Years After. Uh, we're continuing the theme of human space flight, and I'm and now I'm pleased to welcome Deanne Bell, who will serve as our moderator of this outstanding panel. Deanne Bell is a television host, entrepreneur, and mechanical engineer. Her television hosting credits include PBS, ESPN, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, DIY Network, and most recently, CNBC's Make Me a Millionaire Inventor. <laughs> and if they just dropped the word inventor, we'd all be interested. In Deanne is also the founder and CEO of Future Engineers, an education technology company that engages students in online contests and challenges. Future Engineers inaugural competition developed with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and NASA produced the first student designed 3D printing uh, facility in space. Her company was selected by NASA to host the Mars 2020 Name the Rover contest. Deanne, the stage is yours and welcome to the National Academy of Engineering. Welcome, everyone, to the National Academy of Engineering's Forum on Human Space Flight, Apollo 50 Years On. I am joined on stage today by six incredible individuals, each of whom have helped shape the, the history and the future of human space flight. Um, so I'll give a little introduction. Uh, he gave an introduction about myself, but as, as uh, he said, my name is Deanne. I, um, much like many of our panelists today, am an engineer. Unlike most of our panelists today, I have never been to space, <laughs> which gives you an idea of the impressiveness next to me. Um, but I did grow up in Brevard County, Florida, in Cape Canaveral, and I have watched many of you launch to space. And it has been an inspiration in my life and, and one of the reasons that I chose to pursue engineering. Um, I've gone on uh, to have a bit of an atypical career. I'm an engineering TV host nowadays um, and also founder and CEO of Future Engineers. And um, we actually have a current challenge that was launched with NASA where students can name the next Mars rover. So I don't know if you know, but the Mars Curiosity rover was named by a kindergarten through 12th grade student. Um, so right now we have a contest live. It's until November 1st. So if you have any kids or grandkids that want to be a part of space history, I encourage them to go online and submit their name. So speaking of space history, um, I'm going to uh, tell you about our panelists here today, and I want to let you know that their, their placement here on stage is not a coincidence. We really have a chronology here um, from Apollo on to thinking about going to Mars. Um, so uh, right here on my left, we have General Tom Stafford, so NASA astronaut, former NASA astronaut with the Gemini and Apollo programs. Next, we have Captain Bob Crippen, shuttle astronaut, also joined in 1969 in the Apollo days. Next, we have Dr. Sandy Magnus, another former shuttle astronaut, also spent four and a half months on the International Space Station. After that, we have Captain Chris Ferguson, also a former shuttle NASA astronaut, um, also now a Boeing commercial astronaut, which is quite exciting. After that, we have Hans Koenigsmann. He is uh, the VP of Flight uh, and Build Reliability at SpaceX. Uh, he joined SpaceX in 2002 since its inception and was employee number four, debatably three. <laughs> so Hans and I uh, share the title of never having been to space, but I want to caveat that with yet. <laughs> because I'm hoping with all the work going on on the commercial side uh, that maybe all of us will have the opportunity to go to space one day. And at the end, we have Major General Charlie Bolden. Uh, he is a former shuttle astronaut and also former NASA administrator during the Obama administration and really oversaw the transition from the space shuttle program to a new era of space exploration where low Earth orbit is now being turned over to commercial entities, and we're looking forward to new technologies going on to Mars. 
So the way the panel is going to work today is we're really going to separate it into three different segments. Um, the first segment, we're going to give all of our speakers time just to share a bit about themselves. Um, and then we're going to have about a 30-minute Q&A, and then we're going to transition out to the audience. So start thinking about your questions and what you want to ask our panelists. Okay, so we're going to start over here on my left with General Thomas Stafford. You ready? Yes, I thought so. <laughs> So, General Thomas Stafford received his bachelor's degree with honors in electrical and mechanical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and graduated first in his class at the United States Air Force Test Pilot School in 1959. He then went on to become an American legend. In, in 1965, he piloted Gemini 6, the first rendezvous in space, and in 1966, he commanded Gemini 9, demonstrating a rendezvous, rendezvous used in the Apollo lunar missions. He headed the mission planning analysis and software development for Project Apollo. As commander of Apollo 10 in 1969, he flew the first rendezvous around the moon and designated the first lunar landing site. He also commanded the Apollo Soyuz mission, which culminated in the historic first meeting in space between U.S. astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts, ending the international space race. He also holds the Mach 36 world speed record. General Stafford has flown four types of spacecraft and more than 100 types of aircraft. As commanding general at Edwards Air Force Base, he presided over the development of multiple aircraft. Also at the Air Force, he conceived of and started the stealth aircraft programs and the roadmap for the F-22 Raptor. At this point, I think you understand why it is my honor and pleasure to introduce General Thomas Stafford. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it was a real pleasure to talk yesterday about the Apollo program and how the decision was made in only about three weeks from the time that Al Shepard flew until the fact we'd go to the moon when Shepard had 15 minutes of flight and only five minutes of weightlessness. And other factors entered into that, like Yuri Gagarin's flight, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and the analysis of what the Soviets would do on a free return trajectory around the moon to say the Soviets had been there first. So. It was a, a real dynamic time, and I used my, the knowledge I'd gained from the, my good friends, Dr. Gilruth, Yvonne Braun, Al Shepard, and those people to talk about it. So it was really enjoyed it yesterday for those of you that were there. It was really a lot of fun. It's a great time to be there. But as I look at Apollo and Gemini, we set the tools because we didn't know what we didn't know. And for example, uh, on that first rendezvous and what would happen if you'd lose a computer, the, the radar or the platform. And then later on this first spacewalk around the world, a CERN did, nearly got killed. And uh, I could have been killed too. Uh, we then evolved, you got to train for it better. So from that, today is a rule, you t train underwater before you go out and do a spacewalk. I mean, also now they have virtual reality you can see with goggles to look at it. So you train that way. That came from Gemini 9. Also from Gemini 6 when Wally and I had our engine shut down at T0 with the liftoff signal. And we knew we had a dead man's curve about three quarters of a second. We learned that you've got to have a mix in there of the system, not maybe complete automatic, but there's a manual override and all this. This has to be a, a very uh, complex thing you do and you do it right. Uh, we also learned lessons like on Apollo 13. I'm sure you've all seen the movie, a lot of it. And that is uh, a lesson like you learned back in high school chemistry. When you mix acid and water, you always pour acid into water. You do not pour water into acid <laughs> because you have some bad results. Well, we learned from Apollo 13, you don't mix liquid o oxygen with compounds that have carbon in it because on Apollo 13 we had about five and a half pounds of carbon in those phenolic blocks and the Teflon wiring and 300 pounds of lox. You've seen, all seen probably the pictures that blew that double wall steel and canal tank to pieces and also a quarter of the service module out and say it's one of the better days of Apollo to get 13 back the first free non-trajectory. So that was a series of things. and. Uh, so, and then uh, I was involved in the shuttle return to flight after the Columbia accident. And 
then in briefing with uh, working with Admiral Gaiman, who chaired the accident board, there's a whole series of things you do. Like Admiral Gaiman said, he could have used the word challenger anywhere that he had the word Columbia. The same lesson. So there's a lot of rules that you do not violate. And we set these tools in place. And they're all there. And so the, the main thing is don't screw up. <laughs> the, uh, you know, it was a great time to be there. And, but also, like she mentioned, I started this, all these stealth programs for the Air Force. If I had not had the experience of being in the Soviet Union, and Krip was with me as one of my support crew members. And then later, having uh, the HAB blew the first experimental stealth airplane when I was commanding general there. I would have never started the F-117A or write the specs for the B-2 bomber, the AGM-129, and start the roadmap there for the F-22 Raptor fighter. So it's a, a whole series of things. It's a great time to be there. So I'll, I'll cut short in my, a couple of seconds. <laughs> but, but in other words, there's rules out there, there are tools out there, and you do not violate them. <laughs> There's rules and tools, you do not violate them, and do not screw up. <laughs> All right, so our next panelist today, we have Captain Bob Crippen. Captain Bob Crippen was the pilot of the very first space shuttle flight in April 1981 and went on to command three other space shuttle missions. During his 30 years in the U.S. Navy, he was an attack pilot and served as a test pilot instructor at Edwards Air Force Base. In 1969, he was selected as a NASA astronaut and was on the support crew for the Skylab 2, 3, and 4 missions and on the Apollo-Soyuz test project. Captain Crippen became director of the space shuttle program at NASA headquarters and then director of Kennedy Space Center. He entered the private sector as a vice president at Lockheed Martin and then served as president of the Thiokol Propulsion Company. Captain Crippen earned his bachelor's in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2012. It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Crippen. Thank you, Deanne, and uh, good morning. I am really pleased that Al Romig pulled together this panel of uh, friends of mine that uh, <laughs> It's great to be up here, especially with my former boss and friend, uh, Tom Stafford. Uh, as he indicated, I, uh, he selected me as one of his support crew for the Apollo-Soyuz mission and uh, took us over to, uh, to Russia, to Star City, and the Soviet Union. Yes, it was, but it was still the Russia part of it. <laughs> and, uh, and even out to their, uh, their launch site, uh, which was, I think we were the first foreigners to, uh, to ever visit that. And then I had the pleasure of tucking uh, Tom and the rest of his crew into the command module for their launch on Apollo Soyuz. So uh, we go back a, a long ways, as he, uh, he indicated. But it's also a pleasure to be up here with Sandy Magnus and Chris Ferguson, uh, who flew the, the last shuttle flight. And one of my fondest memories, I was just telling uh, Sandy, was uh, John Young and I got to, my commander got, and I got to do a, a photo op uh, with them because we represented uh, the bookends of the space shuttle program, if you will. Uh, I, um, I joined NASA right after Apollo 11, uh, 50 years ago, long time, so I'm older than dirt too. But uh, <laughs> uh, I had come off a program that was uh, a highly classified uh, Department of Defense program called the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, a MOLD for short. Uh, it was highly classified just a few years ago it was finally declassified. Our job was to uh, take high resolution photographs of the Soviet Union. Uh, but when that program was canceled, uh, they took uh, seven of us crew members off of that and transferred us over to the NASA astronaut office. Um, we didn't do any training, didn't go through a selection process with NASA. We just walked in the door and they put us to work. But uh, there were some similarities between uh, the Skylab program and uh, what was being developed by NASA and the MOL. So uh, that was my first assignment was to go follow or bird dog what was going on with the development of Skylab uh, to make sure the crew interfaces were acceptable. Uh, and I uh, 
worked throughout the program and uh, its flights, which started off uh, kind of traumatic, but it ended up being a, being a great program. When that was concluded, uh, I was assigned to go start doing the same thing following the development of the space shuttle, which had just been uh, announced. Uh, so a lot of people think of the job of an astronaut as mostly uh, training, but uh, most of my career uh, with NASA was spent in doing uh, engineering work uh, following the development of the spacecraft. It, uh, and I would imagine that uh, the current astronaut office is doing the same thing with the uh, vehicles that are being developed today by Lockheed, Boeing, and SpaceX. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, engineering work that uh, the astronauts are assigned to do. I, uh, <clears throat> I was both surprised and, uh, and honored when uh, John Young, our most experienced astronaut in the, uh, the office at that time, uh, selected me to be his crewmate for the first space shuttle flight, STS-1. Uh, it's great training with John and, uh, and flying the, that mission, uh, certainly one of the highlights of my life. As uh, Deanne indicated, I went on to command three other flights, and it turns out most of those flights were also engineering test flights to make sure the space shuttle would do what we uh, had designed it to do. And uh, when looking back, I'm, uh, I'm very proud of the space shuttle program. Uh, yes, we had two terrible accidents and I lost some very close friends. But uh, when you look at the sum of the 30 years that it was flying, uh, early on in the program, we did some uh, important Department of Defense missions that uh, I think uh, contributed significantly to us uh, winning the Cold War. Uh, the shuttle made it possible to fly uh, payloads like the Hubble Space Telescope and the other great observatories that have revolutionized our knowledge of the universe. And it also made possible the building of the International Space Station, which is an engineering marvel that uh, is still up there today doing its job. So in, in summary, uh, I think the, the space shuttle program is something we'll look back on uh, fondly. It'll be a long time before we ever see a vehicle that's anywhere near as capable as that. Uh, and I was sorely disappointed when uh, in 2011 uh, the program uh, was terminated and I was primarily disappointed because we didn't have another capability to put our crews in space and would be dependent on, uh, on Russia to do that. And we have been for the past eight years. So I'll conclude with that because I'm anxious to hear how the Starliner and the Dragon capsules are going to correct that problem very soon. So thank you. <laughs> All right, for our next speaker, we have Dr. Sandy Magnus. Dr. Sandy Magnus was selected to the NASA Astronaut Corps in 1996 and has flown on four shuttle missions, including the final shuttle flight in 2011. She flew to the International Space Station in November 2008, where she spent four and a half months on board the ISS as flight engineer and science officer. Following her assignment on station, she served at NASA headquarters and as the deputy chief of the astronaut office. During her time at NASA, Dr. Magnus worked extensively with the international community, including with Europe, Japan, Brazil, and in Russia. Dr. Magnus is now the Deputy Director for Engineering within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Research and Engineering. Prior to working at NASA, Dr. Magnus was a stealth engineer at McDonnell Douglas. She earned her Bachelor's in Physics and Master's in Electrical Engineering from Missouri University of Science and Technology, and her PhD from Georgia Tech. Help me in welcoming Dr. Sandy Magnus. So I want to take a moment to talk about the space station, because I think that's why I'm, I'm on the panel. And thank you, Al, for the invitation. Um, and let me start off by saying there's a big difference, as many of you in the audience know, between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge, between book learning and, and going into a lab and actually touching something. And that's when you really understand things, when you have that experience with the knowledge. And, and I think that's one of the biggest changes that happens with astronauts when we fly in space, whether it's short term or long term is that we experience that environment and we experience the planet a different way. And when you fly on space station, it's really interesting. Uh, you, you adapt into the environment at a completely different level than 
when you're just up there sort of as a tourist for a 10 or 11 or 12 day flight. And I didn't even realize that was happening until the, the crew came to pick me up uh, in March when, when I saw them float across the hatch and they looked so awkward and so unsure of their motions and, and, and just tippy, you know, not tippy towing, but you know, just very gingerly moving their, their bodies and as they moved through the, the spacecraft trying not to touch things. And I basically said to Koichi, I said, hey, let me, let me take you back. He was replacing me. I said, let me take you back to the, um, the service module and show you how to use the treadmill. And I just took off because I knew immediately what handrail I was going to bounce off that handrail and then I was going to bounce off that handrail and I was going to go straight through the, the PMA and hit that one bag and, and I knew exactly how it was going to translate through. Newton's laws, by the way, drives your world when you live in space. And I just took off and, and Koichi catches up with me eventually and he's like, wow, you really move fast. And I was amazed. I was like, really? I didn't realize it. And that's when I realized I had adapted to a whole new level. And it's interesting because um, when you experience that and you realize it was normal for me to get up every morning and, and float through my day and talk to people around the world uh, in different countries about all the amazing science and, and things that we were doing, it was normal to have the earth out the window to the extent that after uh, maybe a month or so, I almost took it for I did, I took it for granted looking out the window that there was an earth floating by below me and the beauty of it and, the, and how amazing that really was. And so we have this ability to adapt that I think is really important. But when you're up there and you're experiencing it, it, it changes your perspective. And let me share one of the, the greatest perspective, perspective changes that I had. And that was the pers perspective about gravity. And this is everybody on the stage who's been in space has experienced this, but to me it was absolutely incredibly amazing as we were re-entering re and slowing down and falling back into Earth's gravity well to experience gravity for the first time as an external force. And it was weird and it made no sense and I was appalled at how horrible it was. <laughs> and, and, to have, and to have that shift, right? We, everyone in this room understands gravity intellectually because we're all scientists and engineers and you, you know the equations and we can describe it and we can quantify it, but that's not the same thing as understanding it instinctively and internally because you've experienced it. And the fact that when you hold your arm out like this, and there, there's actually, I mean, think of all the little diagrams you've done in physics, right, where you get the vertical forces and the horizontal forces and all that crap. So, so you, you, there's a vector acting on your arm that you are using the energy of your muscles to, to basically fight against. And it's just weird to experience that. And it makes you look at the world in a whole different way. And this is really the power of sending humans into space because we have these new experiences, it shifts our view of the world, and we start thinking about questions that we should be asking that we don't think about asking because we take for granted the environment they're already living in. So it opens up our minds to new ways of looking at the universe. And it makes us think just a little bit differently. It's just that little bit shift in perspective. And so that's what's so powerful about sending people in space, and that's what's so powerful about having people in space for a long period of time and doing the kinds of experiments that we do up there. Maybe not all those experiments are cutting edge, but I guarantee that as we continue to put people up there with different skill sets, as we continue to put different kinds of experiments up there, we're going to learn more, I think, from the questions that we learn to ask than from necessarily the answers we're getting from those experiments, because we are just at the beginning of wandering out of the Earth's gravity well, wandering out of the norms that we've established here on the planet to open our minds to new ways of thinking and new questions to ask. And that's really what is the power of sending humans into space and the human space program. And I'm really excited about where we are now because we're at the point where we can get more people into space to have these perception shifts based on their experience base and we're going to think up some really amazing questions to ask in the next decade. So I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. All right, and on to our next speaker. So next we have Captain Chris Ferguson. Captain Chris Ferguson is Boeing's first commercial test pilot astronaut, and he will be among the first to go to space aboard Boeing's CST-100 Starliner. He's led the development of the spacecraft's mission systems and crew interfaces, working hand-in-hand -hand with NASA. He was also a leader in the development and testing for the spacecraft's launch and ground systems. 
Captain Ferguson is a retired U.S. Navy captain and former NASA astronaut, having piloted Space Shuttle Atlantis, commanded Space Shuttle Endeavour, and commanded the final shuttle mission, STS-135. He also served as Deputy Chief of the NASA Astronaut Office and a spacecraft communicator for multiple Space Shuttle missions. Captain, Ferguson's hold, uh, Captain Ferguson holds a Bachelor's in Mechanical Engineering from Drexel University and a Master's in Aeronautical Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. It's my honor to introduce Captain Ferguson. I always love listening to Sandy Magnus' stories. Um, she makes space seem so incredibly compelling. Even the audience, some of whom have been in space, looked and listened very attentively, myself included. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do is maybe talk a little bit about the future. Uh, Crip had mentioned that uh, the shuttle program ended in 2011 without an immediate replacement to get us back to low Earth orbit. Uh, we had been working diligently uh, over the course of the last eight years. Uh, 2014 specifically was when the big contract was let to return Americans to low Earth orbit aboard a commercial spacecraft. Uh, it warrants a little bit of an explanation of what exactly is a commercial spacecraft. Uh, what really is happening here is NASA will begin purchasing services. They will begin purchasing services to take astronauts from the surface of the Earth up to the International Space Station and return them safely after about six months. The benefit of something like this is it allows NASA to focus on exploration missions beyond low Earth orbit and turning the role of transporting people and cargo to low Earth orbit over to commercial companies. And it comes at a great value to the taxpayers. Uh, we are actually on the cusp, uh, after some delays, of uh, returning Americans to space, and I think you'll see that it came out in the news probably late this year, early next year, uh, after a, a, an absence of about eight years. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to show you this. This next chart will look a little bit like the, uh, the NFL's red zone, if you're familiar with it, but it was my way of avoiding the two-chart limit. Um, oh. Actually, this one first, just a real brief description of what our vehicle looks like. On the left-hand side there, you see the spacecraft, which is the, uh, the, the vehicle that will take astronauts up and down. Uh, it has a very Apollo-like appearance, appearance. It will carry up to five uh, astronauts uh, up to the station, stay there for six months and return them safely, and remain on board as a lifeboat should we, should we ever need it. Uh, the service module will be jettisoned uh, just after the deorbit burn, and the crew module will be recovered at one of our five West Coast landing sites. It will be a land landing. We're going to launch uh, on an Atlas V rocket. Atlas V is very proven technology, uh, about 80 flights to their credit since the early 2000s, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, all of the, uh, the modifications, by the way, have all been made out to launch complex uh, uh, 41, uh, which was previously uh, an, an uncrewed only launch, uh, launch facility. And uh, the, uh, the two vehicles, the what we call OFT and CFT launch vehicles, are there sitting and waiting for the payload to show up, which will happen very shortly. Uh, I mentioned the NFL Sunday ticket. So you uh, are the, uh, the red zone. You have an opportunity uh, just from left to right, top to bottom. Uh, we are in the process of training the very first crew. Uh, I will be the Boeing representative. We'll have two NASA astronauts on board with us, Nicole Mann and Mike Fink. Uh, we actually will provide or, or get all of our flight support in the form of mission operations from a team in Houston comprised of uh, a lot of the, uh, the mission controllers that actually service the, the very tail end of the space shuttle program. So we're going to leverage a lot of the capability that NASA had uh, as a function of uh, safely operating the space shuttle for 30 years. Uh, we're going to launch, as I said, aboard an Atlas V uh, rocket uh, from Launch Complex 41 at the uh, Cape Canaveral facility. And uh, we will land at, uh, again, one of our five uh, West Coast landing spots. The object is to, uh, it's to dock to the space station within about 24 hours. The first missions may be just a little bit longer so we, complete all, so we can complete all of our test objectives. Uh, and then we'll remain there docked for, uh, for up, to six, uh, up to six months. Uh, once we get a go from the ground that the weather and the conditions at the landing facility are clear, uh, we will undock. And in a short period of time that will last on average of about six hours uh, from undock to uh, recovery, uh, we will land in the western United States and, uh, and recover at, uh, ideally, uh, our primary site will be the White Sands uh, Test Facility. Some of you are familiar with that. We have two landing uh, areas there, one at the north and one in the south. We have another in a town called Wilcox, Arizona, which is uh, not too far from the Mexican border and essentially in the middle of nowhere, which is what we really like. Uh, the um, uh, Dugway Proving Ground up in Utah 
and then the Edwards Air Force Base in, uh, in California. Uh, next up is a big uh, moment for us. It's uh, what we call our pad abort test. Uh, this, again, will be conducted at the White Sands uh, test facility. Actually, this vehicle will roll out to the launch pad there uh, in the very near future, and you will see this test uh, if all goes well with our final preparations in November, which uh, to us is a, uh, is a very big stepping stone leading up to our uncrewed test flight. Uh, we will fly an uncrewed orbital test flight, which will dock to the International Space Station prior to putting a crew on board uh, in, the, uh, in the near future. So again, that's just a little summary. Uh, I do look forward to your questions, um, but uh, this is what the future of space flight holds. Thank you. Okay, now for our next speaker. Hans Koenigsmann is Vice President of the Build and Flight Reliability Team at SpaceX, where he leads the company's quality engineering and process development teams, oversees the launch readiness process during launch, and assesses and resolves launch risks. He's built up the avionics, software, and guidance navigation and control departments at SpaceX, and developed their launch readiness process. He was the Chief Avionics Architect of the Falcon 1 and early Falcon 9 efforts and Launch Chief Engineer for the last three Falcon 1 missions and most of the Falcon 9 flights. His experience also includes the development of suborbital and orbital launchers as well as several satellite projects and attitude control systems, both at his previous work in Germany and at Microcosm in California. Dr. Koenigsmann has a PhD in aerospace engineering and production from the University of Bremen and a master's in aerospace engineering from the Technical University of Berlin. It's my honor to introduce Hans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on this panel and I realize that um, my flight time is about less than your space time. <laughs> <laughs> so. So obviously I got to work against that here with more, with more slides, I guess. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video of the Denmo-1 mission. That was the, the mission that was the uh, Dragon spacecraft um, going to the ISS and docking there unmanned and, and completely autonomous. Um, and it's in preparation to the, um, to the uh, um, manned flight later this year. Um, um, so I'm actually going to just start this here. This is Falcon 9 on, a, uh, on what we call the... Nice launch check and countdown net. Pad is clear. Go for launch. LC-39. 9, pad. 8, 7, uh, Where all the shuttles six, and, uh, and the power launch from. Four, it's mission control three, in Hawthorne and two, at the Cape. So, one, two different rooms. Let's off. We got mission control in Hawthorne. Inside of the food bag, and you see Little Earth and Ripley, <laughs> and uh, that's the view from the uh, from the spacecraft as the uh, the astronauts would see it. Just March two this year. Vehicle is supersonic. Stage separation confirmed. Exactly. Second stage, and the uh, first stage. Landing like uh, deployed. Turn to the and Falcon 9 has landed. There. Dragon uh, separation confirmed. Dragon separation. And then the phasing begins and uh, getting closer to the space station. And Houston the, uh, Station, space ground to ISS thruster is enabled. Little Earth is a gravity sensor for us. This is the actual thing. It's not. <laughs> this is one of my favorite uh, phases. Houston, Station Dragon Hatch, open at 1307. On behalf of the Ripley, Little Earth, myself, and our crew, welcome to the Crew Dragon. Little Earth stayed up there. Houston, we brought on two. No, I just crew is ready for departure. We crashed it down and brought back by the uh, demo and the tool machine. Separation, CD yeah. confirmed. The nose will close for the, for the entry. It's, uh, Pop in and back to the ISS. Joke should deploy. We have four health sheets. And main sheets. The cover of this is to receive. Dragon has landed. And this is the recovery boat. Uh, we got two of those. All right. So I threw everything on one slide, too. 
except it's just pictures. <laughs> And, and one thing, after, um, after Tom's, Tom's talk yesterday, I had to add the Emmy on it. Um, SpaceX and NASA, NASA and SpaceX in this case, uh, got an Emmy for the, for the webcast. We do a webcast for every launch. It's, uh, it became pretty popular and, um, and it's, it's, it's exciting. We, um, it's, it's just an event and, and we, the whole thing is very popular. So obviously, um, apparently, people thought we can, we can own an, an Emmy for that. Uh, the rest of the pictures is, is, is Screwdragon, and you can see uh, on the top there, actually there should be a laser here. Uh, there, these are um, Dragon capsules in different stages, basically from development to, to beginning integration. Down here, this is the final integration in the clean room. Uh, this side is mostly avionics down there and, and lots of cabling going to other places, basically. And then on this side, you see a little bit more propulsion. This is where the, par the parachute goes. These are propellant tanks. And then these devices over here are the, the super dragos. These are thrusters um, that basically move the spacecraft away in case of a problem. It's an escape thruster, an escape system that's integrated. And that's one of the things um, that is uh, different between Dragon and any other spacecraft. Uh, the integrated system allows you to use then those propellants. If you don't use them for escape, obviously, you can still use them for for um, you know, maneuvering in orbit, and it extends your range on the spacecraft dramatically um, compared to a, a tower that has a, um, a rocket that you then throw away. And um, we, are, uh, we are also heavy into training. This is an emergency training. Um, I think this is a, a fire, fire drill down there, uh, part of it too. Um, I wanted to add a picture that reminds me of other things we do. We had 76 um, launches of Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, and SpaceX um, started business in 2002. So we did this relatively quickly, and the, um, the main thing is these, these launches, um, the majority of those were within the last three or four years. Um, it's pretty amazing how, how fast we ramped up and how, how many launches we do currently. Um, this one in particular is a landing of two boosters in parallel. Uh, we, we, we invented the parallel landing um, <laughs> operation, and um, landing the boosters and reusing them is, is an incredible advantage if you want to fly over and over again, if you want to do this quickly, because it allows you to just put another second stage on there. We, we're actually starting to reuse the fairings too, so, so um, we're extending our reusability, and, and it just allows you to gain so much experience in, in, in a much shorter time and to start iteratively um, improving your spacecraft based on what you actually get back and what you see, and, and, and you can analyze it and work, work on, on reliability with that. So with that, um, I just want to point out we, we will, we will um, sorry, this was the one. We will um, perform the mission as soon as possible. Um, we got the hardware coming to the Cape pretty soon. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I have. I encourage you to make it quick. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, are you done? Yeah, I'm taking. Oh, back. okay. Yeah. Sorry, Thank interrupted you. you right when you finished. My <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>, pleasure. <laughs>
I don't know whether Gerst is still here or not. If you are, did he leave? Okay. Um, one of the things I learned a long, long, long time ago when I came to the Naval Academy and then when I, again, when I became a Marine and went through basic school, they always said, listen to the gunny. Those of you who have served in the military will understand what I'm saying. Listen to the gunny or listen to the chief, which means you have very smart people who uh, happen not to be officers. Uh, they're staff NCOs, and if you listen to them, they will not steer you wrong. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to say Bill Gerstenmeyer was a gunnery sergeant or a chief, but in my mind, in my time as the NASA administrator, that was my gunny and my chief, and uh, so I thank you for everything you did. Um, real quickly, let me talk about some things. Uh, I've had an opportunity to work with everybody on the stage at one time or another, and Hans reminded me this morning that we actually worked Brimsat, which was one of his satellites that he worked uh, um, when he was still in Bremen, and uh, it was one of the, the, the final experiments we had on my last space shuttle mission, STS-60, in 1994, and we almost didn't get to launch it, but it turned out to be absolutely incredible because we were able to get it off. But some of you, Crip reminded me of, uh, of Hamilton, the Broadway show. How many of you have seen Hamilton? Okay, if you haven't, you ought to go see It's awesome, for one thing. But there is this musical reprise in it when everybody talks about who Hamilton, how, what impact Hamilton had on them or they had on Hamilton. And you get to Aaron Burr and Aaron, everybody's singing and Aaron Burr and says, and I'm the damn fool that shot him. So uh, as Crip says, I'm the damn fool that that ended the shuttle program in 2011 when I was the NASA administrator and I was also at the Cape when, uh, when Chris and his crew landed and I was in tears uh, because I had spent my entire NASA career with, I had overspanned the 30 years of shuttle and so I knew what a tremendous uh, thing it had done for the nation but it was really time to make the transition and I agree with Crip, the crime of it was that we did not have an, a replacement immediately available so that we could go fly again, and, and hopefully we, you know, will make, not make that mistake as we transition to lunar orbit and, uh, and then on to Mars. Uh, another thing, you know, Crip mentioned what the shuttle brought us, and I will continue to emphasize this. I think shuttle will go down in history. Its legacy will be its introduction of diversity and inclusion to NASA. Uh, the ability of people to fly who could not fly before, that will be the legacy of shuttle. Uh, things to look for that are happening now with these two guys, with SpaceX and Boeing. We never tested the escape system on the launch pad in, at, at, at Kennedy until after we had the Challenger accident. We should have done that. They have now done that. So you have people who work on the pad every single day, and they depend on a, a way to get off. These are the workers, not the astronauts but the workers that need a way to get off the pad every day if something really bad happens. And we had an opportunity to use it once and we didn't because we didn't have confidence in the escape system. These guys have already taken care of getting rid of that. So those are some things that have happened. Selection and training of astronauts because as Sandy said, the big thing about where we are today is that we're gonna allow people, some of you sitting in this room, you may not think so, but you may actually have an opportunity to go to space if only for 20 minutes. That will change your perspective on this planet. And so if you get an opportunity, find a rich friend, uh, you know, get them, to, get them to foot the bill for you, but you need to do that. And, uh, and then the last thing I'll say, because a lot of you are involved in academics, get your students to understand they don't have to be astronauts. They don't have to be scientists. They don't have to be engineers. We need people today who think about food and think about drugs and medication. We can't, we don't, there's no supply ship coming every 30 days or every, you know, three weeks. We're going to have to have stuff that's sustained for years at a time. So lots of things people can do. So I look forward to taking your questions and helping you understand how you help kids get interested in, in uh, taking a part in this thing, no matter what they do. All right, now is when it gets fun. <laughs> Not that that was incredibly fun already, but now we're going to do some Q&A. And I really want to start our, our discussion today really by celebrating history. You know, we're, we're talking Apollo 50 years on. 
And we, when you think about the Apollo program, you know, at its time, it was on the cutting edge, you know, from Saturn V to the command module to the lunar module. But from a human perspective, it really taught us, you know, how humans have the capacity to explore and to pioneer. So I'd love for each of you just to share one aspect of Apollo, you know, whether it's a person or a moment or a feat of technology that's inspired you or influenced you uh, in your work in space or in life. <laughs> so I'm going to start, uh, why don't we start here? Because I think you started as a NASA astronaut in 1969, Bob. So I think uh, you've, you probably have countless inspirations to share. Well, I was uh, inspired, uh, actually, uh, the original Mercury 7 Okay. people were part of my inspiration, and then Tom here. Uh, but uh, as I said, I joined the program while Apollo was in progress, uh, but it was the people in it uh, that really inspired me uh, to try to emulate them. Sandy, how about you? Five, when the Apollo landed, uh, when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, and so I, I don't remember much of it. Sorry, <laughs> okay. um, but I will say that what's really inspiring about the Apollo program is the fact, again, you go back to perception shifts, right? Now all of a sudden we put people on the moon and it really, really inspired the whole world about, hey, wow, if we can do that, then maybe there's something I can do in space too. And so for those of you who live in the DC area, uh, on October 21st, uh, here in DC at the Convention Center is the International Astronautical Congress, which brings together the whole global space community. And what we're celebrating this year at that Congress is the impact of Apollo and 50 years on to see what has happened in the space industry in those last 50 years. And it's gonna be an incredible display of not only what the United States is uh, accomplished and continuing to aim for, but what the rest of the world has engaged in too. And so the theme of the conference is um, power of the past, promise of the future. And I think, you know, that, that pitiful, pivotal moment when men stepped on the moon really inspired the whole planet to where we are today and the trajectory of where we're going tomorrow. So it continues to have an impact and I think that will be true for the next 50 years as well. So for those of you who are in DC, I invite you to come to the Congress and see what's going on globally in space. It's pretty impressive. I was eight and uh, I do remember watching it on a black and white television in my parents' basement. It was, uh, I mean, it obviously stuck with me. Uh, I, uh, I sort of went on and I still, my mother saved these little sketches I would make of the lunar module. I was a pretty creative eight-year-old. Um, <laughs> but hey, fast forward. Um, I read a book called Digital Apollo. I don't know if anybody here has ever read that book, but it was not a story about astronauts. It was really not even a story about people. It was a story about how we did it on a technical level. How did we get to the moon? I mean, we invented guidance systems that didn't exist. We invented docking systems that nobody really would knew would work. But how did we really do this? How did people position themselves to land on the moon? And it was just a, an amazing treatise in there about how does an astronaut stand? What does he look at? What does he want to see? When does he turn from going backwards to going forwards? What, I mean, there was these amazing discussions in there about how we really did it. And uh, that actually served as a bit of a motivational force for how do we design our new spacecraft? What do we, do we have to etch the glass so the pilots can see the horizon? Do we need an altimeter? What does the docking system need to do? Why does it need to function the way that it does? And uh, it really, I think, helped us a little bit. Um, so we, we, we played on a lot of the Apollo legacy just in designing our capsule spacecraft. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was six, right between the two of you, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I, I was near sighted and uh, in, the, in the wrong country. <laughs> so so, so I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for, for having a chance actually to, to work on the next generation. And, and I felt a little bit on, on, I mean, Apollo is an incredible inspiration for, for I want to say, everybody working at SpaceX. But the... Um, Part of what we do is also to recreate that, to, to have this boldness of building a device and going, you know, filling it up with like dangerous propellants and then putting fire under it and going to, the, going to the moon. That is an incredible thought. That's really hard to explain to people that are not engineers or not scientists and haven't seen that. Um, so, so to me, that, that was one of the, the key drivers. I want to do that too, yeah? And, uh, and um, you know, 
very thankful to, to, to Elon Musk and Gun Shotwell to have an opportunity to actually do that and, and hope, hopeful, hopeful that we, we will see you know, Mars and Moon and Mars in the next uh, decade basically again and, uh, and have a chance to, to stay longer and stay maybe permanently. Um, that would be great. I'm, a, uh, I'm not going to say I was five or six because I wasn't. I was, a, uh, I was in my last, in the throes of my last few months as a student naval aviator. I was at Meridian, Mississippi, uh, going through flight training in the T-2, getting ready to go back to Pensacola to go aboard the boat. And uh, I had no interest in space whatsoever. I had, uh, I had admired the original seven. I, you know, we were sitting at the, in the BOQ watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin descend to the surface of the moon. And I was mesmerized by that, but still no interest whatsoever. And it took a person uh, to really get me interested in the space program, and that was the late, great Dr. Ron McNair, who um, personally inspired me and embarrassed me into submitting my application for the astronaut program because he reminded me of something my mom and dad had told me all the time growing up in South Carolina, that you can do anything you want to do if, you, if you're willing to work and put your mind to it, and I'd forgotten that. And Ron, uh, Ron asked me, when he asked me if I was going to apply for the program, I told him, not on your life. And he looked at me real strange, as some of you heard yesterday, and uh, he said, why not? I said, they'd never pick me. And he said, you know, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> how, do you, how do you know if you don't ask? So I, I was challenged, and I did. But I was inspired by Apollo after becoming a part of the program. And I think I was most inspired during my eight years as the NASA, almost eight years as the NASA administrator, when I learned that people who have no clue about rocket ships and uh, sometimes don't know which end is up, play an importantly critical role in, in the very future and, the, and, the, and whether or not we exist. The reason we weren't ready to go into human space flight from, <laughs> from the U.S. right after we phased out a shuttle was because we could not convince the Congress uh, that a commercial space flight program was the way to go for the U.S. The reason that uh, we went to the moon was because we had a president uh, surrounded by people like um, George Lowe, uh, Tom talked about some of them yesterday, but people who refused to say, we can't do this, we don't know how, was what they said, but we'll find a way. And so it, it, Apollo inspired me to work that way with people who make decisions to help them understand why. The social media has changed the game, pro and con, but following the example of SpaceX and the way that they utilize social media uh, NASA has really gotten into the game of informing people. So when I talked yesterday about it, it's, it's not either or, it's an and. Uh, government and industry, government and entrepreneurs have to work together. And I learned that was my inspiration from Apollo was finding out that, man, there are a lot of people who don't have a clue what you're doing and could care less, but, but they're the ones that are going to help you do it. All right, Tom, you have inspiration drawn even before Apollo, so do you want to share it? Well, one of the four missions I flew, uh, again, the most uh, impressions is the changes as far as your, your view is when you flew to the moon. There's only 24 of us that flew to the moon, 12 of us left around now. But uh, that's unique because when you're out there, it's about the size of an orange. And that's why I wanted to pioneer color TV to show what, to share that with people. And it worked out real well. But uh, speaking about that, and the uh, experiences you go through, like uh, Gemini 9, where I nearly, it was a heck of a time getting Cernan back in that spacecraft. We could have lost them and even myself. And uh, from that, we developed training underwater. But there's a, a great movie out. I recommend it to you. And I saw it. It was made in Russia about Alexei Leonov, my good friend, the one I shook hands with on Apollo Soyuz. And they had the premiere and the Kremlin, Putin was there, and Alexei, about 6,000 people. And later, when I was over there with my group, uh, on the ISS Advisory Task Force, they had a special showing for us in the Museum of Cosmos. And they showed us that movie. I think Apollo 13 is probably the most realistic of the uh, space movies you see in the United States. But this movie called Space Walker, you can get it from Amazon. It's got English subtitles. It's probably one of the best movies and most realistic I've ever seen. It is unbelievable. 
and I recommend it to all of you. It's, uh, it's about a two-hour movie. And, uh, but that uh, getting Cernan back in was, was something you'll never forget. Well, too, uh, uh, it's, I'll never forget. I told Krippus a dinner last night. Uh, I, I, I didn't have time to go into it yesterday. But on that second stage burn on the S4B, the third stage, when I was on a translunar injection, picked up 11,000 feet per second. We got up around 32,000 feet and it started to vibrate like a, it was like a pogo, but it wasn't. Uh, the frequency was the same, but the amplitude was building. And I told John Young, I said, John, this feels like flutter, but there's no aerodynamic forcing function on this thing. And it kept getting more and more and more and more. It got so bad, it's a four and a half vibration. I remember by about 34, 35,000 feet, I could not read the instrument panel. And I thought the thing was going to blow apart. And over here was the abort handle. Turn it 45 degrees to the left, and that would have shut the engine down. I knew it would be gone on a, a, two, a day and a half, at least, abort. And uh, so. This is why you have test policy as commanders. I said, if it blows, it blows. <laughs> and, uh, so finally it shut down right there. We picked up 11,000 plus feet per second, 36,600 feet per second. And we were then six tenths of a foot per second on our computer, matched the computer down on the Saturn V. And I said, what the hell was that? The, I, we just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And, uh, so John turned around and said, hey guys, look at this. There's a stabilizing bar we had in Apollo that stabilized the couches to the spacecraft. And the last thing before they close the hatch is disconnect that stabilizing bar and lock it down. Well, guess what? He didn't disconnect it. And furthermore, I told back to Mission Control and said, check the, the, the G's we got on this vibration. I uh, said, so it's really something. And uh, they called us the next day and said, well, it looks like we had a problem with the tank pressurization and vent valve sequence. And about a week later, I got a call from Dr. Von Braun himself with his German accent. He says, Val, Colonel Stafford, Tom, he says, he owes you an apology. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what's that, Dr. Von Braun? He says, well, you remember a, a vibration you had at the end of the S4B burn. For, you remember that? I said, remember, hell, I'll never forget it. <laughs> he says, Val, we had this event of cabin, uh, the, pardon me, the tank pressurization valve set too close to the vent valve. And he got into a harmonization sequence. And that fed down into the engine, which fed some more. And then we were on this stabilizing bar, so we were on a cantilever. So we were really shaking all the pieces out there. <laughs> but we fixed that one real easy. We made double sure that when they closed the hatch, the stabilizing bar, two people check was down. And number two, they set a wide variance between the tank pressurization and vent valve. And no other Apollo had the problem. Amazing. I am also so impressed that your memory is like a trap. <laughs> <laughs> like he's like quoting speeds. <laughs> I'm so impressive. Um, all right, so on to the next question. I really want to look towards the future of space travel uh, or, or human space flight. I know on the horizon we have so much excitement. We've got the commercial crew program. We've got space tourism. You've got Artemis. We're going to the moon, and we're using that as a stepping stone to go onto Mars, and some people want to retire there one day. Uh, there is so much excitement. So I'd love for each of you uh, to share... Uh, you know, what you're looking forward to most about the future of space exploration, and what do you think the critical technologies are that are going to get us there? And are there things from Apollo that still resonate today? So we'll start in the end, Charlie, and then we'll come back this way. I, the critical technology right now is what we call, uh, you know, we've just got to figure out how to land. Uh, the kind of masses that we're talking about landing on Mars. So uh, uh, that's something we've got to figure out. Again, if I go back to what SpaceX is doing and has done. Um, we had talked to them about, you know, flying a dragon to Mars and, and landing because it would give us data uh, about a, a, a propulsive landing, uh, retrograde land, retro propulsive landing on Mars. Um, 
again, working with the private sector and experiments that they're doing that, that keeps NASA from having to do that, allows them to go on and, and develop the, the exploration part of the program. Um, the other thing is the human body. Uh, we know quite a bit more than, we, than we've ever known before, thanks to a lot of the experimentation that's going on on station today. But, um, you know, long-term survival on Mars, I, I, I think we'll be okay, but it's just, it's sort of like a commercial you see on television that says, well, I think we'll be okay. Uh, okay is probably not good enough when we're talking about that, so, so we probably need to figure out exactly how we're going to keep the crew uh, safe in the radiation environment of Mars. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of going underground and uh, using the Martian soil as a, you know, as a as a safeguard against. So humans live underground, and that's enough for me. <laughs> Hans. Yeah, the logical step is Mars. Um, <clears throat> SpaceX SpaceX was built with the um, the background of uh, making making the human species multiplanetary, which means Earth and Mars, for now. And, um, and, and obviously the big technical problem going to Mars is money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there, there are some technical problems too. I mean, <laughs> money, money plays into that too. Um, space, space flight is, is super expensive. And, and, and so one, one obvious uh, knob to turn this is, is reusability. And it's not just reusability, it's a rapid re reusability. So um, currently, uh, we use our boosters 10 times. Um, they're designed for 10 times. We, we, we're going to start the fourth time with the next launch, actually. Dragon has been used three times. Um, Crew Dragon will be used up to five times. And so all these things help because you don't have to build something again. You have to, you have to um, you know, inspect it, refurbish it where you need to refurbish it. But ideally, you want to keep that really, really low. Ideally, you want to keep this as low as possible, like an airplane, basically, so that you, you, you inspect it. It's still fine. And you have scheduler. Uh, scheduled regular ma maintenance on, on, on boosters and, and, and um, you know, others. We, um, we just recently recovered a fairing um, coming, coming from a second stage, basically, in a, in a, in a big net and, and saved it from the water, falling into the water, which is super, super useful. Um, and then we're going to refurbish that. And, and so, obviously, we're working part by part. Um, Starship, we're working on that. Um, is going to allow us to, to um, use the second stage again too, and then it really becomes the cost of fuel and the cost of, of some maintenance on, on the operations, basically. And that's where we, where we need to go. So that's the technical side. We need, on the other side, also help in, in, in terms of we need payloads, we need um, users, we need people that actually use that service. And that's, that's basically where, where everybody can, can pitch in here and, and help us. Um, because obviously, if you have this capability, somebody needs to use it, and, and, and that's super important too. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's primarily it. Mars reusability, rapid, and you know, not to mention, of course, reliability and safety. When you reuse stuff, um, you can actually make it safer because you see you see the booster coming back. You see possibly leaks. You get more data. We have we use video cameras all over the place. We just pull them off and look at them. Um, so so that helps you too. So. Reliability, safety, reusability. Chris. I think the biggest asset we have right now uh, that will enable us to get to Mars in the not too far distant future is about 240 kilometers that way. It's the International Space Station. It's the place we're living to, uh, learning to live and work for long uh, durations. Uh, how do we purify water? Right? How do we get to recycling uh, 95, 98 percent of our water? How do we remove CO2 from the air? How do we add oxygen? How do we make this all work in a system that absolutely positively must function for the duration of time that it takes to get to Mars and back? And we're perfecting those systems on the International Space Station today. I think we have to look beyond 2028, where uh, the current end of the ISS's life is, and ask the question to Hans's point, where are the users? Who will build the replacement for uh, uh, the place to test and develop uh, long-term uh, assurance that these systems will, in fact, work on the, the day that we eventually do leave low Earth orbit for the Martian surface. So there's, I look at this two different ways. Number one, there's breadth of access, which we're trying to increase in, in low Earth orbit. And the biggest barrier to that is really the cost of getting people and things up there, which our industry partners are, are working on um, to try and, you know, the re reusability is a key. Uh, clearly to try and low, uh, lower the launch costs, but also the frequency of launch. Because if you're, you know, go to the cases of the users, if you're a user, you want to be able to, to be sure that you can get access frequently 
um, based on whatever the pace of your business model requires. And so those are two dynamics that are still playing out, and we'll see where we get to with the current plans. And then with respect to going further beyond low Earth orbit, I think the key, you know, to the radiation question, we simply, we, we have a lot of questions there. We need to understand the answers to those questions and manage that problem, because radiation is not going to go away. So that is, is sort of, a, I think, what we have to do there. To Chris's point, um, recycling is important, but I would say it's beyond just creating a 100% closed life support system. It's also everything else. You know, think about the logistics train that we might have to um, establish to support people on Mars, and it's, it's ridiculous to imagine how you manage that. So we have to figure out how to recycle everything that we take into space, how we can use the materials on the planetary bodies uh, upon which we place humans, and, and there's a lot of work that has to be done in that area. And oh, by the way, that kind of work will eventually come back and benefit Earth, because you know, we have finite resources here on our planet, and we have to figure out how to recycle a little bit more here, too. So I think some dual-use technologies that we can be working on that will benefit both the human push beyond low Earth orbit and our planet. Well, I do firmly believe that humans will visit Mars someday. Uh, but before we do that, uh, not only learning to live off the planet on the ISS, but we need to learn to live on another planetary body. And uh, we're lucky enough to have the moon that's just a few days away, as opposed to months going to Mars. And it is a great test ground for uh, learning how to live off this, uh, this Earth that we, we're all lucky enough to do. And uh, there are many questions to be answered, uh, radiation being a significant one. Uh, and uh, we ought to take advantage of that. The, the trips that we, have, we did make to uh, the moon were all little camping trips. Somebody else said not. They were short, short duration kinds <laughs> of things. And to live there is a total different problem. And uh, we need to solve that. Bob. Well, Bob really brought some points that uh, we uh, outlined in this year's study I shared for President Bush Sr. and Vice President Quayle, how to go back to the moon and on to Mars. He hit it right there. And uh, But uh, one thing, you are going to need a big booster. There's no doubt about it. You see, people have things to sell. One can always want to sell you a series of small boosters and put them together. The math just doesn't work. Believe me, we've been through it many times. Uh, Radiation, absolutely. We've got to have a way to protect for radiation. That's one of the big risks. And assuming that your system's engineering is good and your systems have enough reliability to get you out there. Perhaps a nuclear thermal rocket for Mars. You don't need it for the moon as far as upper stage propulsion. And the, uh, oh, again, the two things you got to recycle is water and oxygen. And you know, for example, on Apollo 10, I lifted off about 6.4 million pounds of mass. I had 300,000 pounds to Leo, who over, and 100,000 pounds on them. So I had really 4.8. How did you do that? Really? How did you do that? <laughs> well, I'm just all I had was 4.8 percent in Earth orbit. <laughs> and then when I, on TLI, what I had was useful payload was 1.6 percent. Now the human being uses about 2.2 pounds, depends on your weight, 2.2 pounds of oxygen a day. So that means you're going to have to have 50 to 75 pounds of mass for every day you breathe unless you recycle. You're going to have to have 6.5 pounds of water a day, and that's going to take that much more. So you've got to recycle that. And so there's a lot to be done. And I'll hit one other thing that's kind of sticks in my craw. We hear the word commercial. Well, I was on the backup of the first Gemini flight pilot. I was a backup commander of the first Apollo flight and then flew the last one. So I was there from the, really the start to the finish. And everything NASA bought and purchased was from commercial entities. It was all commercial. And except we had insight and, and related requirements, but the contractors is a good team. But the word commercial means NASA steps out of the way. I, I, I kind of disagree because NASA ha did everything on Gemini, Apollo, and even the shuttle was all done by commercial people. None by NASA. Zero. 
So I want to bring that out. <laughs> <laughs> I did a bunch of research, and something that wasn't uh, that I didn't include in your bio was was at some point the guidance system that that you did hand calculations in space because the guidance system failed. Correct? Now you understand <laughs> how he can do that. <laughs> he, he's a human calculator. I love it. Um, so uh, you know we have a short period of time here, but I'm going to do one more question, and we might only get a couple people to answer this before we go to the audience. Um, you know, the space industry is highly competitive, as we know. It has a history of being competitive, um, but it's also highly collaborative. The scope of what we're trying to achieve requires us to really collaborate. Um, now, you know, in, in the commercial era, still highly competitive and highly collaborative. Um, how, how does that balance I guess give me some insight on, on that delicate balance and, and, and why we need both. And I'd love to start with Sandy, because um, I know you did a lot of work uh, with international agencies during your time at NASA. Yeah, it is a delicate balance, and I think it's, um, it's a good dynamic because there's a push-pull amongst the different entities. The competition's good because it makes everybody keep, keep innovating, and the collaboration's good because we learn from each other, because it still is quite... Risky, quite dynamic, it was a hard, it's a harsh environment to try to operate in. And so keeping that balance where the learning happens across the community, but there's enough competition and poking at each other to, to, to spur people to do better is, is really awesome. And I think it all works at the end of the day because in my experience working with people around the world in the space program, what I have found is that everybody is really, really passionate about the mission of flying in space, whether that's machines or people or both. And because everybody buys into that and, and feels that and is passionate about that, we can conquer all kinds of uh, issues that might otherwise create uh, fractionization and, and, and just complete dysfunctionality. I mean, we still have some, but in general, the whole community pulls together because they believe in that passionate thing. And it's one one, one thing that I talk about with respect to the International Space Station program is it shows you, you know, going back to collaboration and cooperation, it shows you that program, what we can do as human beings if we really want to, to accomplish something difficult. It's the most complex, highly technological program ever conceived and executed by people, and it involved numerous different countries with different agendas, different languages, the English system and the metric system, and that's a mess too, but, uh, but <laughs> political situations, but this, this project, this multi-decade project worked because everybody who was engaged in it at the end of the day really believed in it and had their passion towards it. And there's no reason why we can't solve any problem uh, that is facing us as a global population if we take the same attitude, but that's why the, the competition and the collaboration work so powerfully in the space program because of this passion and this total commitment to achieving the end, uh, end goal. We don't have a ton of time, but who wants to take this one? Charlie? No, I'd say ditto. Ditto? <laughs> <laughs> SpaceX, Boeing, how about you guys take that one? I, I, I don't know, I mean, I feel like when you, when you actually, there, there's a layer of competition and that's good, and then there's also a, a, a level of cooperation, uh, cooperation when, you, when you're on the launch pad, um, that, that everybody works for the mission, and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter on which company they work for in many cases. And, and the same applies to when things go wrong, um, that everybody feels terrible when things go wrong. Um, and I've, I've found this, at the end of the day, um, people that work in space are passionate about space, and, and the, you know, they, they want their company to succeed, of course, but, but there's, a, there's an overarching level that, that people want things to go well and, 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 and to be safe and, and reliable. So that, that, in many cases, is actually more important. I found that pretty refreshing in many cases. I'll just talk uh, dollars quickly at a very high level. If, if you look at what it costs to develop this shuttle, uh, it was between 30 and $40 billion in 2010 dollars, give or take, depends what source you look at. And the shuttle program uh, was about $3 billion per year. Uh, and that got you about five, four to five flights per year, depending upon you know, the, the year. But uh, if you just look at sort of the way the commercial crew program is evolving, um, for the cost of operating the space shuttle program for two years, a little bit over that, you're getting two different 
providers that are contracted to do a full development, two test flights, and six service flights back and forth to the International Space Station. So now, just looking at it at the dollar value, it will turn out to be a very good value for the American taxpayer when we execute. Um, so where does that reinvestment dollar get paid? And I think the intent is to reinvest that in exploration technology to get us to the moon and get us back to Mars. The idea being, like I said earlier, uh, let's invest in low Earth orbit, let's provide a commercial capability to get cargo back and forth from there, and now soon to be humans back and forth from there, and allow NASA to, uh, to go beyond low Earth orbit with that taxpayer investment. Now we're going to transition out to the audience for questions. And uh, while we do have mics set up, we actually have someone that's going to walk around. So if you have a question, you don't need to scoot your way out to the aisle. Just raise your hand, and someone will come meet you with a microphone. My name is Jedi Huang uh, with the Materials Engineering of NAE. My question is about uh, Space Force. Um, the space, a new military branch was created the last year. Uh, <laughs> so um, we, are, we are going to have an additional branch for the armed uh, services. With your real world experience in space, uh, your perspectives are very valuable to make sure the new branch would uh, uh, operate to its maximum efficiency and it deliver um, the best uh, uh, value. So I just like to see the panel to share some of your uh, views and also maybe specific suggestions so the, uh, the uh, Space Force will be operated accordingly. So the question is your views of Space Force? Yes. Okay. Or, or suggestions as well. Or you take that. Would you like to take that, Tom? Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> Okay, uh, you know, the way that uh, force has been evolved over the years, started with armies and later somebody invented a boat in the Navy and that went on for years, but there's lots of Stu and Diggity who invented a boat, the wheel, but uh, then the air. And I think the first shot ever fired was a uh, Italian I bought the Malaria two-place flyer, the type you crossed the English Channel in 1910, and had some fight in the Balkans, and somebody fired a rifle out of the back seat. I don't know if we hit anybody, but anyway. So, you know, air became then a domain of force projection. And so all you're doing in this case, you're going higher and you're going faster. And to think that... Uh, it's not going to be, it's to be, I think, a little naive. And we know already in open literature what the Chinese are doing with hypersonic glide vehicles. And that's out in space. So. Anyone else want to take that? No? <laughs> <laughs> we have internal views on Space Force up here. <laughs> okay, next question. Yeah, my name is Dan Baker from the University of Colorado. I'm a practitioner of uh, space weather. And many of you on the panel have mentioned space radiation as a concern. I guess my question is, how important it is, is it to you and your mind for the future to have forecasts of what the space environment is going to be and to have adequate warning to help, uh, let's say, prepare for the a more transient kind of space uh, radiation effects? I think it's important for astronauts, but not nearly as important it is, as it is for us on the planet. Uh, you know, space weather today, I'm speaking to the choir here, it is how we, we, have, we anticipate problems to communications. Uh, you know, we've been very fortunate in that we have not had a major space weather occurrence that's knocked out <laughs> Uh, satellite communications and, and the like, but that is a possibility. So I think uh, long before we need to worry about what's the risk to a, a crew member flying in space, uh, we've got to continually have an, uh, an ongoing, improving, technologically developing space weather capability just to protect us here on the planet. 
I think some of the ideas that have been floated on protecting astronauts um, for, uh, from space radiation, and, and I understand there are some advancements being made in polymers, uh, but one of, the, one of the most practical uh, applications I've seen is essentially create, you know, the, you know, in effect, the Van Allen built around a, a spacecraft, which of course is extremely power intensive. So I, I mean, this is, a, this is a problem that we're going to have to solve, and I'm, while I, I would strongly advocate the prediction of such events, I don't know how good we're going to get to say, hey, you're good for three years. For your three-year trip to Mars, you're going to be just fine. So ultimately, we're going to have to beat the problem back. He asked about space weather forecasts. I mean, from, from my perspective, I, I watch the space weather every time when we launch as much as I look at the, the other weather. It's the same, same, same. I mean, it has different effect in that sense that that you 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 care about you know life on board and um, and and the electronics rather than than wind in the in the upper atmosphere. But but it's it's a, it's just a factor that goes goes into the whole whole picture and whole environment. We'll take the next question. Right here. Yes, yeah, so from a com from a commercial perspective. What is the end goal? Where, where do you see this, this program in, say, 25 years or 50 years? What's your vision? And this could be Hans or Chris or Sandy or any, anyone in the panel. It's a good, a good question, actually. Um, we, um, we work currently on, on fixed firm contracts, and frankly, one of the discussion of commercial or not, I find that a, a, one of the biggest discriminators, yeah? um, whether you actually tell, ask somebody, build, build that to me, and, and, and don't, this is the, the, the amount of money you get, and, and you're on your own, yeah? Um, Mostly, it's not quite. It's not quite like that. We get some support, obviously, but uh, and we work. We work as a team always. But but at the end of the day, the money is, is finite that you, you get for something, and that's a model that I can see helping the um, the cost keep in control because we are very cost conscious. We're not. We're, it's not billable hours like you have in other um, you know um, professions. <laughs> So, so because that's what basically cost plus is, right? It's a billable hour, and, and, and it just um, it just goes goes up, and as the incentive is just not there to keep it low cost. So, I see this as a as a currently we we, we keep these these contracts in that way, and then it becomes more and more of a service. And and um, I forgot who said it. I think it was you. It could be it could be like a a service that you you. You book your, like you book your ticket, basically. You have a certain amount of money to bring stuff from, um, from the ground to, to the moon and, and, and whatever it is, basically, and some, some amount of money that goes to Mars. But fundamentally, costs must come down dramatically in the next 25 years in order to make this work, in order to make the, the whole economics of it, of it close. Otherwise, otherwise it, it, it might just be too expensive. So if I may. Go ahead. Um, Go for it, Sandy. Yeah, so in a perfect world, 25 or 50 years from now, probably closer to 50 than 25, the, to Tanz's point, the cost of launch will have come down. So people like you guys who are very creative and, and have a very good expertise in certain areas have an opportunity to go have these perception shifts that, that I mentioned earlier. And then the creative juices flow, and you think of things that you can do in, in low Earth orbit, things you can take advantage of with microgravity, or, or business ideas, because what we're really missing now is that piece. What, we have a lot of um, capabilities that are going to be coming online, but we haven't quite figured out yet how to develop the markets or how to develop the use cases for the broader com private enterprise, if you will, not using the word commercial, but the broader broader private enterprise. And so getting the access for people to get up there and have good ideas, figuring out what are the platforms beyond the space station um, and what other kinds of um, adventures we can create in space. So 25 to 50 years from now, I'm hoping that we've started to solve those problems and you see some of that wedge of activity becoming sort of normal. I'm, an, uh, I'm the eternal optimist. However, <laughs> comma, this is one thing that bothers me because we all talk about, you know, 25, 50 years from now. We don't have that long. The International Space Station is a machine. And all of you in this room are engineers and science, most of you. Uh, I'm neither, but I've been around you long enough to know that machines break. 
we have probably four to eight years, I think, of life left on the International Space Station. Money is not going to help that. You know, we just don't have a way to get enough pieces and parts there to refurbish it and make it new. So we've got to, something's got to step into its place or we're going to be exactly where Crip was and I was as Aaron Burr who shot the space shuttle. We're going to shoot the station with nowhere to go. So somebody's got to come up with a business case that helps people understand that, you know, there is value in going into low Earth orbit and having a pharmaceutical laboratory. There is value in going to low Earth orbit and having a materials processing laboratory because we've demonstrated all that on the International Space Station now for 19 years. That's what the space station's purpose was, to demonstrate to people in business that this is an incredible, incredibly potential money-making venture. Nobody's bought that case yet. And until somebody buys that case and makes the investment and says, I'm going to put a platform up there, I thought Bob Bigelow was going to do it, to be quite honest. Bigelow has had the beam on the International Space Station now for four or five years, and it has not stepped off yet. So am I being critical? You bet I am. Because NASA spent a lot of money, the government spent a lot of money allowing private, the private sector to go and use this test facility so that they could step off and go make money. Uh, you don't make money if you're not willing to take a risk. And hanging around the International Space Station is, is risky in one respect, but it's not a business risk because you're having room and board and transportation frequently provided by the government. The government doesn't have enough money for all of you conservatives here who believe in the free market, uh, you got an opportunity. Jump off the International Space Station and build the low Earth orbit infrastructure that we have got to have if we're going to successfully send humans back to the moon and on to Mars. Enough from me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hey, can I just put a, uh, ahead, yeah. I, I, just to Press. finish the, bring the point home, you know, Boeing and SpaceX at no small cost to the taxpayers are developing two new capabilities to get back and forth to low Earth orbit. We have one customer right now and that's the International Space Station. We need other markets to evolve. It's taken nine years to get this far. This is difficult. This is the first time we've done this as a country in 40 years since we developed the space shuttle. Without a destination in 2028 or a commercial market that builds, will we really be ready to retire the capability to get back and forth with humans? I, I, I sure hope not. Um, and Andrew, you, you wanted to say something? Well, yesterday uh, I mentioned how fast the Apollo program was turned on. It was done in about three weeks. And also, in the same way, the uh, uh, Space Exploration Initiative of President Bush senior started was turned off in about as fast by William Jefferson Clinton when he became president. Just bang, he turned it off. So that was Bush's program, not mine, it's off, boom. And really the same thing happened over in the Obama administration. It wasn't within three weeks, but it was turned off. The Constellation program was turned off. Now, I don't know who's going to win the election next November, uh, a year from now, but uh, that can be turned off real fast, what we have there. So I, I can't forecast who, who's going to be the chief executive in there for the next, say, two or three cycles. But that can go on, it can go off. That's the big risk. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, yep. yep, we got <laughs> questions, but I'll. <laughs> try to limit it to Hans. I'm glad you can see well now. Um, yes. <laughs> what about the competition, uh, Jeff Bezos' company versus SpaceX? Where is he? He's got also, uh, their company can also have their rockets land back where they took off from, which is quite amazing. But is that serious competition to SpaceX? I, I would definitely say, I mean, Bezos... Yeah, he can pay for it also. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, um, they, they are, they are, uh, their competition, they're building, um, building great vehicles and how, how, however, they, they, they had, I mean, we are, we are ahead of the game right now. There's one big step that a rocket needs to do and that's go to orbit. Um, 
and, and that is, in some cases, has been proven to be harder than, than people thought, and I've, I've learned that myself. It's hard to get to orbit, um, so we, we have that advantage right now, but at the end of the day, it is competition, and we welcome competition. We, um, we feel like it gives us, it gives us an edge because we are now, we now push to work harder. We, we, we push to work um, you know, on, on lowering the cost and becoming the best competitor among other competitors. Next question. Hello, my name is Tom Johns, University of Wisconsin in Madison. First of all, I want to thank the Academy and the panelists for really an exciting, inspirational session. Uh, since we have a lot of engineers in the room, I'd like to ask a question about the future commercialization of space and striking the right balance between speed and safety. Uh, we've seen during the session and, and uh, the incredible advances that are being made, driven by competition in terms of advances very rapidly in terms of the, of the technology, arguably not fast enough. But on the other hand, this last year has also brought us some insight into what can happen when speed can lead to screw-ups uh, with regard to basic laws of, of, um, of aerospace engineering in, in, in terms of redundancy. And, and, and so finding the right balance between those two is, is, uh, uh, is, is always a challenge. I'm just curious of what the panelists, uh, panelists might comment about what's going on, what the future holds, the role of NASA on one hand of advocacy, but on the other hand potentially in, involved in terms of, dare I use the term regulation or, or uh, providing that, that uh, safeguard uh, against a, a kind of disaster that would be an uh, incredible blow for the uh, whole industry if it happens uh, at a critical moment. Thank you. So I think at the heart of that question, it's about uh, how do you balance speed and safety? Okay. I'll start. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you need to have both. And uh, safety, speed does not, speed does not mean uh, you don't operate safely. Uh, safety has, safety is a mindset as much as it is anything. And uh, Hans and I were talking about this a little bit in brec at breakfast this morning. The safety mindset says, we may be two seconds from launch and I don't feel well and I say stop. Uh, you know, that's the critical part is having people who, who um, have the ethical background to say this is not right, the shortcuts we're taking are not right, and, and you go back and look at, at the program that you have in place and adjust it as necessary. The government doing it, NASA doing it, doesn't mean, because we generally take longer, that doesn't mean we're any more safe than the private sector. Uh, you know, going slow doesn't guarantee you're going to be safe either. It gives you more time to do stupid stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I, think it, I think it's a delicate balance. It's a mindset. Uh, you know, I, I visited with an engineering school recently, and one of the pleas from undergraduates was we need to be taught uh, an ethics course for engineers uh, so that we don't, you know, because one of these days I'm going to have to make a life and death decision and that needs to be ethically grounded and so there are a lot of things that don't have anything to do with math and science and engineering that we've got to make sure the young people of today uh, understand. There is right and wrong. There is what is ethical and what's not ethical. And uh, there's a good book for people to read, and it's talked about how the Challenger occurred. Um, you know, the, the underlying title is, um, I forget. That's what, <laughs> that's what happens at my age. But, but when we allow things to go on that we know are not right, uh, we infuse that attitude or that culture in our young people. So we as engineers and scientists have got to teach them uh, how to think ethically and how to make the right decision, even if it means the program is slowed for a while, because nothing will end a program like rushing to the end and having it blow up on you. Uh, that's done. That's it. Uh, people get over being years late and dollars over. People don't frequently give up, get, up, get over Having, we have never recovered from losing two shuttles. I think, I think all of us who've, who've been on spacecraft will say that. You, know, you, don't, you don't recover from that. Uh, there, it's always a scar that you carry with you. So get it right. And Chris, and I it, mean, you're, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. If I may, it, it's, the other thing to really think about as opposed to speed is just complacency, right? 
you you get you you get into this mode where it become you know normal operations and you and you forget to question things because things are normalized so it's not really i think a speed thing it's a matter of staying always alert and thinking about what you're doing and questioning and listening to to the system and making sure that you can have a, an environment where people can bring up questions because that's really where you're going to create the right safety environment, whether you're moving fast or you're moving slow. So it's all about avoiding that complacency. And that's hard, right? Because I talked earlier about how adaptable we are as human beings and how we normalize to situations. Um, if you look at those accidents, it was really all about complacency and quitting. You know, we weren't questioning as carefully as we should have been doing. Let me amplify what uh, Charlie said. There's another way of saying it, about going fast and slow. The worst thing you can have is an on-time failure. <laughs> you <got it. laughs> um, Chris, you're going to be on board. Uh, you know, one of the first test flights. So what's your thoughts about speed versus safety? <laughs> maybe, maybe I didn't hear your last line. <laughs> so. Um, I don't think that speed and, and, and safety are, are synonymous. I've had the unique opportunity to watch every phase of our vehicles designed from the engineering to the piece parts that come together. Uh, does that make me a foremost expert? No, but it makes me a very interested watcher. Uh, we also work to a, a pretty specific, and Hans, I think you'll agree, set of requirements that come from NASA that are um, sort of bathed in the experiences and the mistakes that NASA has made in the way uh, it has uh, run spaceflight operations in the past. And we have a lot of help from, from NASA. Uh, sometimes too much help, but I'll tell you, any amount of help in, in the right area is a good thing. So I think that this is a very um, appropriate transition between a government run and managed program over to a commercially run and managed program with just enough uh, of the past sort of steeped in. And, and Boeing, you know, or its legacy companies has been involved in every human spaceflight program since the very beginning. And we still work with an enormous amount of people who work shuttle. So a lot of that mentality and, and mindset is still there. But ultimately, I think having folks on the floor and watching the hardware come together, uh, and I've had the unique opportunity to do that, really does build a lot of confidence. Yeah. Next question. Oh, do you I, I, I just want to add, I mean, my motto is only the paranoid survive. So, so you, you got to have the right amount of paranoia. And, and if that means stopping the launch and, and explaining to, to your customer why you stop that for like three days, um, so be it. But it's more important to get things right than to get them, get them done on time. Definitely. Question? question yes. yes. <clears throat> So I've heard uh, so much about the cost and complexity of getting things from the Earth to low Earth orbit as being one of the barriers. Uh, a concept uh, both in science fiction and in some of the serious uh, uh, aeronautical journals has been the space elevator. Is anybody still thinking about the concept of the space elevator? Well, I can tell you when I was AIAA executive director that we have a very passionate community inside the aerospace industry that is very enthusiastic about the space elevator. So there's, it's still out there as a concept. I, have, I, I mean, technically, I think there's still some roadblocks. A lot have to do with the strength of the cables, and people are looking at nanoparticles, and could you weave together some cable some cables of these kinds of materials that are really super strong and can handle all the tension, but I, I don't know all the details. I just know there is a very passionate community out there. Well, a material science <coughs> is a very serious material science problem, but we solve things like that. Yep, yeah. yep. Okay, next question, over here. My life, yes I am life. Andy Jackson, section 10. Uh, I don't want to be a downer on this because it's obviously talking about human spaceflight, but humans are very fragile. And when I hear Colonel Stafford tell us how many pounds of this and how many, we need oxygen, we need this, we need water, we need food. Um, is there an interim step that could be less expensive? Uh, we are, the, the convergence of artificial intelligence and robotic design, um, would it be better to construct a community on Mars which is based on robots, not on people, but the people themselves can control those robots, so you have that experience. It seems like a huge amount of the cost in getting us to Mars 
is protecting these fragile beings, even when we talk about radiation just getting there. So any thoughts on an alternative way to create a community on Mars without necessarily sending people there first? They could go there later. You've got curiosity. You've got uh, soon you'll have Mars 2020 uh, with uh, an experiment called MOXIE. It, it's not people, but they are, they are automated systems that are going to be doing the things that people we hope we'll do later, like extract oxygen from the carbon dioxide atmosphere and so that we can make breathing oxygen and, and oxygen as a part of a fuel. So we're doing that. We've been doing that for 50 years. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a geologist, but I have geology friends who tell me if, if we had put one geologist on the surface of Mars for as long as Curiosity has been there, we probably would have explored the planet by now. So, and, and I, I don't say that as a trivial, it's not a joke, but it's, there is this innate curiosity that humans have that we are not able yet to teach a robot. I mean, artificial intelligence, all these other things, they will be here one of these days, we think. And, and a, an example I'll give you, Hubble Space Telescope. When we found out that Hubble had a spherical aberration and, and we decided that we were not gonna send the shuttle up to get Hubble, um, the National Academy put together, at the insistence of Senator Barbara Mikulski, by the way, uh, we put together a team of people to go off and determine how we could save Hubble. That was the title of the, of the study group, Saving Hubble. And we went into it, all of us did, even the human space flight people saying, we have got to find a robotic, robotic capability to do this. The technology wasn't there at the time. If we had that happen to Hubble today, I, I'm confident that we could probably put together a robotic mission that could go and do a lot of the repairs on Hubble that have been done to date, but that's because we have the experience of humans going up there and messing around with it and finding out things that we can do that we can automate. That's essentially the story, again, of the International Space Station. You've got R2, uh, you've got you know, robots roaming around, spheres. We're just trying to find out how do you offload the human from doing mundane things, and it's now time to send humans to Mars to try try to pull together some of these things that the robots have been doing for 50 years now, I think. You know, look at it as a, a toolbox, right? Humans have certain skills and they come with certain pros and cons, and then machines have certain skills and they come with pros and cons. So just like your toolbox in your garage, you can't, you can't do anything with all screwdrivers or all hammers. You need a mix. And so how you design a mix of robots and humans on a mission depends upon what is the mission and what you're trying to accomplish. They both come with expensive infrastructure, whether it's in space or on the ground. They both come with fragility and, and, and limitations. So you design the mission around uh, the tool, you know, you, you pick the tools for the mission based on what your goals and your objectives are. And I think that's always going to be the case. It's never going to be an either or an or. It's always going to be an and at some level. And let me throw one real quick thing out again. I'm a big fan of Mars. I think everybody knows that. I'm a big fan of using robots in the right place. I think before we put a single human foot on Mars, we should have an army of robots that are put there to burrow into the surface, build out the infrastructure just the same way we do for any American soldier, Marine, Airman, or anybody who goes to any of these strange places in the world today. When they get there, they walk into their hooch. They don't build it. You know, <laughs> Kellogg, Brown, and Root, or somebody else with a whole bunch of robots has taken prefab stuff over there, and they go into an, in, into an air-conditioned space where they can go do stuff. Now, you still got to build, a, you know, dig a foxhole when you get out into the remote parts, but, but we can use robots to build the habitats, and, and that's, that's a business that we could be working on right now. Tom has some thoughts, too. It might be slightly apples and oranges, but to follow on Charlie, you know, I took a curiosity on Mars three and a half years to cover the same distance that Gene Cern and Jack Schmidt did on Apollo 17 in three days. And they brought back 245 pounds of rocks and material. So it's, again, it's, it's, it puts, you need both, and, but it just say it costs more too for Cern. And, and. Next question. A short question, but likely a bit controversial. You talk about competition and collaboration, and it seems to me that one of the big elephants in space might be China. And so I'm interested in your response in addressing the relationship in terms of space and China. Why does everybody look at me? 
<laughs> I'm the guy that shot him You've again. Got the most recent <laughs> you know, you say what you will about President Obama and the Obama administration. In 2010, uh, we thought we were on the verge of having another Apollo Soyuz, but it was going to be a Shinjo uh, shuttle or whatever you call it, and 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 it got shut down by the Congress. So, yeah, you know. All of you recognize, because a lot of your intellectual and, and academic partners are Chinese. Um, everybody's, we got problems with everybody. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> what, what makes us able to work with Roscosmos on the International Space Station so incredibly well, uh, it's mission focus. It's deciding what we're going to do to make the world a better place. When I was named to go command my last space shuttle mission, I was at NASA headquarters, and, and, and George Abbey said, hey, I want you to go back to Houston and fly a, you know, another shuttle mission. I said, what is it? I was hoping it would be to go repair Hubble. He said, no, not on your life. Uh, he said, I want you to go back and command the first mission that's going to carry a Russian cosmonaut. And I told him, I said, George, forget it. I'm a Marine. I have trained all my life to kill them and them kill me. <laughs> and, and I don't want to fly with any damn Russian. And, <laughs> And he said, OK, now that you've said all that, just calm down. Two guys are in town. Go have dinner with them and let me know what you think in the morning. And I met Sergei Krikalov and Vladimir Titov, who are my dear friends to this day, some 20 some odd years later. And because what we talked about that night didn't have anything to do with technology. We talked about our kids. We talked about what we wanted to do for the future. And we became mission focused on figuring out how we could get our two teams together and successfully work on that mission, and it became Shuttle Mir, and now the International Space Station. So I think Tom will tell you the same thing about Lexi Leonov. All the stories. Well, I had the exact same uh, thing. You know, I graduated from the Naval Academy, went in the Air Force because the Korean War is going on, the Air Force had the first swept-wing airplane, and it was knocking down MiGs, and I was a cold warrior. I wanted to go down to, go to Korea, shoot down MiGs, and kill commies. And, and that was what I was dedicated to. All, and then Ooh. I ended up on Apollo Soyuz, and then I realized that all the Russians weren't communists. <laughs> and then from there, then Alexei Leonov was one of my dearest friends, and just like a brother to me. In fact, uh, his granddaughter is named after my daughter, and my two grandsons are named after, uh, well, different sons named after Alexei. But, um, the uh, the whole thing is we can we're really working good together. I was the one that told Dan Golden along with George Abbey about we have to work with the Russians because we needed a crew escape vehicle, and the Soyuz was there. Also, I didn't know that 28 years later I'd be adopting two Russian orphan boys. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Hi, uh, Megan Smith from Shift 7, proud member, hello Charlie, proud member of Section 10. Um, two quick things. Charlie, I loved what you said about ethics, and uh, I always wondered whether we, the NAE, might think about a Hippocratic Oath, you know, like that ring that all the Canadian engineers get from the bridge that fell down when they graduate. But my question is actually with this incredible group, maybe to lift some hidden figure stories. Um, there's so many people, of course, Apollo and the space mission was born at the same time as massive civil rights work was going on for race equality, gender equality, LGBTQ, all, so many people. And at the time, there was a lot of discrimination in choosing who got to go and do different things, but still people snuck in and found their way to participate in these teams. And I thought maybe the panel could lift some of those stories today for us, one or two ideas. Uh, and the one I would share is Betty Skelton, who was the first to first known as, uh, you know, land speed records, flight records, et cetera, who the Mercury 7 used to call seven and a half. Uh, and she embedded with them for a look magazine, like Time Magazine story, um, and did every single test, met with the Russians, did all these things. There's beautiful pictures from the 1961 article, should a woman be first in space, or should a girl, sorry, back then, a girl be first in space. Uh, the spacesuits didn't fit her either, still don't. But uh, just sharing those stories, as there are women, women of all races, men of color, LGBT folks that you might reflect on either during the space race or recently that maybe less people know that you would share and the things that we as an academy can do to make sure those stories are more known. Thank you. 
So I, I can't share a hidden figures kind of story, but I would like to share a story that perhaps addresses sort of the root of what, you, what you're asking about. So I was in middle school when I first dreamed of being an astronaut, and I had no idea how I was going to do it. I had no idea if it was even possible, but it was something that I really decided it, it was just who I was. And when I, in 1978, when I entered high school, there was an article on the front page of my hometown newspaper in southern, small town in southern Illinois, and across the front page was splashed, women accepted into the NASA astronaut corps, and it had a, a picture of all the women that were in that 1978 class. And when I saw that newspaper article and that picture, that was a huge, I mean, I started crying, quite frankly, because at that moment I realized that the dream that I had was possible, that there was a path that there were people like me that I could totally identify with doing the thing that I always dreamed of doing. And over the years, I have sort of synthesized that moment in, into the power of role models and how important it is. Everyone in this room is a role model for some constituency, and I'm not talking about gender or necessarily race, but your hometown, the high school that you went to, the community that you live in, your nieces and nephews, because um, kids never listen to their parents, but nieces and nephews. I mean, <laughs> there is somebody somewhere that you are a role model for. And to your point, what, the, what could the NEA do? This group of people in the NEA is an incredible group of people who are very talented and very successful. And I would encourage you to get out there and be role models and encourage people and excite people about your passion in, in STEM. And that's really what it's going to take. To, to create more and more people in, engaging in our fields. But do not underestimate the power of role models. So I'll just stop there. Yeah. Other hidden figures story? Yeah. I'll uh, bring up one point. Uh, I have three daughters, and uh, I became convinced early in my career that uh, women could do whatever they wanted to. And uh, I had the pleasure of having uh, Sally Ride on my uh, crew on STS-7, and she lived up to everything I expected of her and uh, went on to uh, help inspire other young girls uh, to get involved in STEM kind of projects. 35 years ago uh, today, Kathy Sullivan and Sally Ride were on my crew on 41G, and uh, we, had, uh, we were going to prove that uh, Kathy was quite capable of doing a spacewalk because a lot of men doubted that a, a woman could. Uh, she went out and did the job superbly and, uh, and proved that. And subsequently, we've had all kinds of women do, uh, do spacewalk. And as somebody brought up yesterday, we may have uh, two women go out together on the International Space Station very soon. I'm sure Tom and Bob and Charlie could not imagine, you know, in the 60s and 70s, flying tactical airplanes with a woman on their wing, right, in a tactical <laughs> right. aircraft. And, and uh, women in combat aviation and tactical aviation came about when, when, I, was, uh, when I was a fleet aviator. And, uh, and it, was, it was a bit of a rocky start, but before too long, uh, we didn't think twice about it. Now, on my crew, we have Nicole Mann, who is a Duke colonel in the Marine Corps, uh, a Boeing F-18 Hornet pilot, uh, and she's just absolutely awesome. And, and it's just amazing how quickly things have come about in opportunities in aviation and engineering. Um, you know, we had lead flight directors, uh, two of them who were women, lead spacewalkers who were women. And it's just, like I said, it, it, in the, the metamorphosis of the last 30 years has just been incredible. And I know no one's here speaking directly about Artemis, but we can't neglect that. I mean, for me, as a woman and as a mother of a four-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son, we're going to have a woman. Step but I'm the moon. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, so uh, it is time for us to begin wrapping up, unless someone at the NAE gives me permission to go further. OK. It is time uh, for us to begin wrapping up. Um, I'd actually, uh, we're going to be quick, but I'm going to give each of you your one sentence, just, to, just to, give a, to give a close. One sentence. There you go, Tom. You go first. Work hard. <laughs> All right, Bob. Don't screw up. <laughs> Be a good role model for those around you. <laughs>
the next 12 months is going to be pivotal for human spaceflight. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to repeat you, um, don't screw up. That's, <laughs> that's a nice version. <laughs> What you have, and the time that you have, and the place that you are. <laughs> really great. Thank you. you no, know, and uh, I'll, I'll close just by saying, you know, I had the opportunity uh, uh, many years ago to, to have dinner with Gene Cernan, the last person to walk on the moon. And when he told me about his moon experience, he ended it with, it's all thanks to American ingenuity. And my heart swelled with just realizing it's not just the people in space. It's the scientists, the engineers, everyone, the entire community. You know, the space program has inspired our nation. It's inspired our world. It's competitive. It's collaborative. It's inspired adults. It's inspired kids. And I cannot wait to see what the next generation and the current generation of scientists and engineers and astronauts innovate next in space over the next 50 years. So thank you so much for all of you being here and all of your wonderful questions. Thank you so much to our panelists. It has been an extreme honor. Well, that was just terrific. Uh, and just a great job, Dan Bell. Thank you very much. And the panelists, you brought insight from different eras, different views of uh, Space, space flight and uh, its future. This is just a, a fantastic panel. Uh, I, I will never forget the line, on time failure, that, that's going to be with me for a while. I hadn't heard that one before. That was great. Uh, and the ethics, uh, Charles Bolden, you talked about the, the NEE has a center on engineering ethics and society, and if people are looking for examples and how to bring that into education, contact us and we can, we can, we can help out. Uh, since we're all admitting our age today, um, I'll tell you that I was inspired by uh, uh, Alan Shepard's flight. That was the one that, uh, in my high school, uh, they, they canceled classes and we went down and we had a little like a 21 inch black and white television on the stage and 300 kids in there. And I think a lot of us got so inspired that we just determined we were sophomores then that uh, STEM, a STEM future was was for us. So it was terrific, as you said, inspiration. Thank you again for and another round of applause for everybody. <laughs>